Please turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21. We, um, we last week looked at um, the Apostle Paul and meeting with James as we are concluding our, our uh, series on the missionary journeys of Paul. And although I said we aren't technically in the missionary journeys of Paul, I at least want to cover through chapter 22, which is when he gets to uh, Jerusalem and what took place from there. And You might say that's kind of a conclusion of those missionary journeys. But last week we looked at what I think is one of the most remarkable things in the life of the Apostle Paul that maybe, maybe he even hadn't considered or really thought much about. And that was when he is done with all three of his missionary journeys, has started untold congregations and appointed many elders. As a result of his efforts, many people have been baptized all throughout uh, their, their region, their world, in uh, not only uh, Asia, but even in Europe. And, and, and all, all that we know of the Apostle Paul basically doing except for just the latter things in his life, is already done. And he comes to Jerusalem at the very end of his ministry, and after he's done all these things, preached all these things, and what he's confronted with is James, the brother of Jesus, says to him, people have heard about you and heard you've come, and here's what we need to do. We need to have you go take a vow shave your head, and there's four other guys ready to do it too. You pay for them, pay for yourself to show that everybody should still follow the old law. And if you remember, we looked at that. And Paul, to his profound humility, and to pro Paul's profound devotion to being all things to all men, does it. There was no obligation to do it. We pointed out that the Apostle Paul was right and James was wrong. I, I believe James was off base in doing that. Um, James was an inspired author in the book of James, but I don't think James was right on in this place. Uh, if he was, it was the sense that he was right because of how it would turn out. Paul is the hero in this. That Paul submits to something that he didn't have to submit to. He wasn't under the old law, nor was anybody else. And Paul goes through with something, and, and I'm afraid that the vast majority of us, that would have flown all over us. And it would have, it would have come to a head in that regard. But Paul, with grace and dignity and humility, does as is asked of him to show the power that God worked within him and he submits to going through that vow, which is essentially what we would call the Nazarite vow, and, and does that. Paul has, has uh, you know, Paul's the author of the books of Romans and Galatians that, you know, certainly refute any following of the old, of the old law and the old covenant of holding to such standards as circumcision and other things. And what... James asks of Paul is outside of what was asked of the Gentiles in uh, Acts chapter 15 when they came together. And so to Paul's credit he does it. And I think it speaks volumes about his humility. I, you can almost see Paul in a way being wronged by what's done. But that's not Paul's concern. Paul's concern is what is going to preach the gospel the best in Jerusalem. And what that does is that sets up the stage, you might say, for what takes place at the end of chapter 21 and the beginning of chapter 22. Paul, Paul preaches in chapter 22 one of the probably top five sermons in all of human history in chapter 22 outside of what you would call Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and, and Peter's Sermon on uh, the day of Pentecost, probably Paul's sermon as far as what it means for Christianity 
is probably only overshadowed by those two. Because Paul gives in detail, in his own words, his conversion account. And his conversion account is the most powerful conversion account in the Scripture. And when you analyze it, when you look at it, and um, there are a lot of people that have been converted, many tens of thousands, maybe millions of people have been converted by a walkthrough of the Apostle Paul's conversion. Because a lot of the strongest elements that people in the denominational world want to say about salvation are absolutely refuted in the conversion story of the Apostle Paul. I mean, the, just to give you the cliff notes of it, the Apostle Paul saw Jesus, spoke to Jesus, was blinded and prayed and fasted with an intensity that probably none of us will ever realize. Do you think he asked for forgiveness in that three days and nights while he's, while he's praying and fasting? If you... If Paul couldn't pray himself to salvation in that three days and nights, nobody can. And he had to arise and be baptized, washing away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord. No vision, no speaking to Jesus, no praying and fasting by his part saved him. And he ain't going to save anybody else. That's powerful. And if you let that settle in, that will shake the core of a lot of people in this religious world that think they're okay. Anyway, that's, that's where we're going. I gave, I gave you the punchline before we get there. So, anyway. But I think it's that important. I wanted to say that from the beginning. And you're already probably, everybody in this room right now, is at least somewhat familiar with that account. So, because of Paul's humility in doing the vow, you know, it sets up the opportunities that are going to come. And you'd think, James at least is good intended in what he's saying, in that he's trying to head off a problem. He's trying to save Paul some headache. Trying to save all of them some headache. Well, it doesn't work so well, because Paul still encounters the resistance that's coming. Verse 27, chapter 21. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, meaning Paul, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law in this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple, and he has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian. He's one of the guys in Paul's group with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul brought him into the temple, which is probably incorrect. Paul didn't do that that we have any indication of, but they had simply seen him in, in the city. It says, Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together, and they seized Paul, and they dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, Word came to the tribune of the co cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions. Took soldiers and centurions. What does that tell you? A lot of them. Why does it tell you it's a lot of them? Right. The cohort probably had a probably had a thousand men total. Each centurion, a centurion is a man who is over a hundred men. And so the centurions aren't going on their own. They're taking their hundred men with them. So multiple centurions means there are multiple hundreds of men with them. You know, the military never, they don't send, they don't send the, the commanders of a hundred men out to battle by themselves without their hundred men. You know, so this is a big group coming in. Several hundred Roman soldiers are coming in to downtown. They ran down to them, and when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Yeah, there's nothing like a good beating to end by a bunch of Roman soldiers showing up. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. 
Some in the crowd were shouting one thing and some another. Go figure. As they had not learned the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. When he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of the people followed crying out away with him. And as Paul was brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, May I say something to you? And he said, Do you know Greek? Asking Paul, Do you know Greek? Well, are you not the Egyptian? Then he recently stirred up a revolt and led 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness. Is that who Paul is? An Egyptian that raised 4,000 men up and took them out in the wilderness? Not exactly. He says, I am a Jew from Tarsus and Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. When he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language, saying, Brothers and fathers, hear the defense I now make before you. When they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became more quiet. And he said, So here's the scene. They've been beating on Paul, trying to kill him, essentially. And a mob trying to beat him to death. The Roman soldiers run in. And they are able to pull him back. It's so bad that even with hundreds of Roman soldiers around him, they have to carry Paul to get him to the barracks. Now, their barracks would be a jail, is what that's really talking about. They're, they're for, they're, uh, their stronghold. And so they're taking him in there to, to incarcerate him, to hold him in custody. And right before they get ready to shut the door, Paul said, can I ask you something to the tribune, I mean to the, to the, uh, the commander, to the tribune, and he says, can I speak to the people? And he says, well, do you speak Greek? And he, said, and he accused him of being an Egyptian. And of course we know that Paul preaches Greek and he speaks in Greek and Hebrew and uh, we don't know about any other languages, but maybe so. I think certainly you'd say he probably spoke Latin as well since he's a Roman citizen and all around the, the nation. But, but Paul can speak. And so... Paul, standing on the steps of the barracks, surrounded by Roman soldiers, with the angry mob that just tried to kill him. And Paul motions with his hands, and everybody gets quiet. And Paul begins to speak in Hebrew, which is the language of the Jews. And they all get quiet. You talk about an opportunity. They're going to hang on His every word. And He displays before them one of the greatest of all sermons. What I would say about this and say about application for us in this is what we do in the most stressful and difficult moments of life, can have the most profound experience on others that we'll ever experience. Let me give to you a great example. A very good friend of mine, was the, he was the youth minister that I worked with in, in South Carolina. We were there all the way through the, last, the five years that we were there. While we were there, he and his wife became uh, pregnant with their first child. They found out about, uh, I think, five or six months into that child uh, that there was something wrong with the child's heart. The child went, they went to almost a couple weeks before full term. The child was born. They, they rushed, before the child was born, they rushed down to the 
to what we would, it's the equivalent of, uh, of WVU's medical center, but it's the, it's the medical center in Charleston, South Carolina for the state of South Carolina. Uh, the child was born there. The child had uh, heart surgery about five days into birth and died, I think, on the tenth day of, of life. And, and uh, I, did, I did a part in, in the funeral, and another mutual friend of ours did part of the funeral. And Andy, the, yes, the youth minister I worked with before was Andy, so I didn't have to learn a new name. Um, and Andy, Andy wrote something that introduced his son about about 10 days, about the experiences and his family and, and such, and, and read that. And I will tell you, the faith and the power to do that in that moment was one of the most powerful and profound things I've ever experienced. They have since had a, uh, a girl, and she's having her third birthday this coming week. And so, you know, and they're, and they're going to have their second, their third child uh, again. And so they're, they're doing well. But, uh, but what he went through in that and doing that at that moment with all the, the pain and difficulty and heart-wrenching uh, time that they had, for the 300 or so that were there that day, nobody's going to forget what Andy said. And people are going to look differently at life and their children and whatever because of that. I certainly would have admired and, and thought greatly of him, even if he hadn't done that. But the fact that he was able to, to find a way to do that in that moment, it wasn't without tears wasn't without great difficulty, but that made it authentic. And, you know, it was just powerful. Some of, the, some of the challenging things I've done, the most challenging things I've been a part of, have had some of the most profound effect. Um, you know, whether you liked him or not, one of the most iconic views of our, of our history is going to be when when George Bush stood on top of the rubble with the bullhorn of 9-11. Whether you liked him as a president or not, you got to admit that was a proud moment for our nation. Um, you know, it's just a powerful mo moment to see because, you know, you know that, that's outside, far outside of our scope today. But, you know, if, if nothing else, he will always be endeared is the president that got us through that difficult moment in time. And, and that, that's important. And, and certainly, I believe, step, he stepped up really, really well in that time to do that. And you kind of want, want leadership in that time. You want, you want, you want men like what we had in our, in our past, like, like uh, Truman and Eisenhower and and Kennedy and, and others that throughout different times in our human history, men like Lincoln and Washington and, and Grant and, and others that have stepped up in, in difficult times in our nation. Because of what you say and do then really matters. Now, I'm probably never going to be in a circumstance quite as rich as Paul's, and I doubt you are either. But how you do under pressure, under difficulty, speaks volumes to those around you. Because when everyone else's life is falling apart, and you show faith, you show grace, you show dignity, you show mercy, that speaks profoundly. Some of the greatest examples of, of things I've seen in my life or Christian brothers and sisters I knew that were going through the ringer, but yet showed faith. And I think we would recognize that too. Showing the power of faith through those 
difficult times. And here Paul is in this moment. Why would Paul go through the vow? Why would Paul go through the persecutions? Why would Paul put up with all of this? It's because this moment is going to be a moment that is going to be recorded for all time and have a profound impact on the church, Christianity, as long as the world stands and as a result for eternity. You think about that. Okay, before we get into his sermon, any questions or comments? Let me make sure I drive the point home. In your workplace, in your family, in your neighborhood, when life hits hard, how we act, how we live, what we say, what we do, can probably speak more profoundly in other people's lives than any sermon I'll ever preach. Because people know what you're doing. They know who you are. They know how you live. And they can see exemplified Christianity in the way that you accept, the way you deal with, the way you show kindness or whatever, and whatever you're faced with. Or, they can say, oh, you know, they were just a Christian while the sun was shining. But once it got tough, the real person came out. You know, we, we should not ever be fair-weather Christians. And certainly, now I realize fair-weather is a loaded term when we're coming up on winter. Don't risk life and limb to go to church. To, to be out here if you if you probably shouldn't. You know, you gotta use your good judgment on that. But but you can still be a Christian at home if you're if you're snowed in. Just don't quit being a Christian because you get a snow day. Okay, on to his sermon. And I want to give you I want to go ahead and read the whole text. I don't usually read such long text, but I want you to just get wrapped up in this sermon. And so so many times we we piecemeal stuff. We'll, we'll read a few verses and analyze it. And I do that a lot too. But I think sometimes it's best just to see the whole picture. So I'm going to read his whole sermon. And I want you to, want you to think about this rich moment. He's surrounded by the, the Roman soldiers. He's got the mob that tried to kill him a few moments ago. A mob that was trying to literally beat him to death. The Roman soldiers don't know who he is. And they're trying to kill him because they know who he is. And everybody's listening to what he has to say. And this is what he says. I am a Jew, born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers being zealous for God, and as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus, to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was on the way and drew near to Damascus, about noon a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. And I fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, 
but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And he said to me, Rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on His name. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw Him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And oop, it was on. <laughs> he had to say that, that, uh, that swear word and their idea of Gentiles. And they, 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 they were looked at the next verse right after his sermon. Up to his, this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth. But they heard everything he said up to then. <clears throat> look at when you look at that sermon, you realize Paul said, I was one of you. Raised in this city, and he name dropped. He said, I sat at the feet of Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was recognized as the greatest teacher of all of Jerusalem. I grew up in this city. I sat at the feet of Gamaliel. When the way began, which was one of the the common names for the church in the New Testament. When it began, I persecuted it. And the high priest and the others can say, I went and I got letters and I, and, I, and I arrested them, brought them, and we killed them, men and women. I was on my way to Damascus one day with letters, with authority to bring back Christians. And long about noon, I saw a bright light and I heard a voice. And the voice said, Why are you persecuting me? And I said, Why, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. You talk about a profound statement. You ever hear something tough and it, and it bounced around your head for days? I guarantee you that statement from the sky, I am Jesus of Nazareth whom you are persecuting, those words didn't easily get out of Paul's ears. He had to be led by the hand because he was blinded. And he prays and he fasts for three days and nights. As The three days and nights uh, details in, in Acts chapter 9 in, when Luke told the account. But he prays and he fasts for three days and nights. And Ananias comes to him heals his eyes, and says, what are you waiting for? Rise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on His name. A lot of people will say in the religious world, you need to call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. And I will say that is exactly right if you mean what Paul meant by it, if you mean what Peter meant by it. Because Paul said calling on His name is being baptized and washing away your sins. In in sect. 
in, in Acts chapter 2, the apostle Peter quotes Joel and says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then when they stop him in the middle of his sermon, in Acts 2.37, they say, what shall we do? Peter does not say to them, I already told you, call on the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. Instead, he tells them to repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. So, the only way you can reconcile Peter's quotation of Joel 2, of calling on the name of the Lord and you'll be saved, with Acts 2.38, is to recognize we're talking about the same thing. That repentance and baptism is a calling on the name of the Lord. It also dovetails rather nicely with Acts 22.16 in this text, that calling on the name of the Lord is to submit to the Lord by belief, by, by responding to the Lord's invitation, by a repentance, as we see in Acts 2.38, by an acknowledgement or a confession of, of Jesus as our Lord and being baptized. When you look at that sentence, um, you know, I, I am no uh, expert in the English language, um, but I, what I did, uh, did learn a little bit along the way, and calling on the name of the Lord is an adverbial phrase. Okay? It's an adverbial phrase, calling on the name of the Lord. And what does an adverbial phrase need? It needs a verb, doesn't it, to describe? There are three verbs in the sentence that is there. What are the verbs in, in, in Acts 22.16? There is rise, be baptized, and wash. I don't think anybody would suggest that standing up is calling on the name of the Lord. I'll let you pick which one of the other two. Be baptized or wash away your sins. Um, being baptized is what is what is told. Washing away your sins is descriptive of what being baptized is. We call on the name of the Lord by being baptized. We are submitting to the Lord by coming to Him in the way that He has given to us in Scripture and being baptized in, in that regard. That's what it means to call on the name of the Lord. Um, if you can speak to Jesus and be unsaved, if you can see Jesus and be unsaved, in a miraculous conversion. Because people say, well, I saw this light, I felt this in my heart, whatever. I guarantee you, whatever they saw and felt wasn't more intense than this, or authentic than this. We'll even give them that it was true. I don't believe it, but we'll even say, if what you saw and heard was true, it's not greater than this. Many times people will say a sinner's prayer, and it takes them a minute to do it, I doubt many of them have the intensity of the blind Saul praying and fasting for three days and nights. And if he said, forgive me, I bet he said it a thousand times in that three days. I mean, who wouldn't? I mean, it's just nonsense to think that he didn't ask for forgiveness in that three days. You know, you, you get confronted with the fact that you are killing Christians and Jesus takes it personally and says, why are you persecuting my Christians? He didn't even say that, does He? It's even more personal. Why are you persecuting me? That is a do not pass go, do not collect $200, great, go straight to eternal damnation moment. Really. When you, when you get confronted by the Almighty God that you're persecuting me, you're sunk. If it were not for the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. The grace and mercy of Jesus Christ is, is intervening. But what does Paul have to do? Jesus does not tell Saul how to be saved. What does he say to him? Go to Damascus and what? Wait, 
There you'll be told what you need to do. The arrangement to catch Saul's attention was a miracle. But Saul had a man explain to him the gospel just like everybody else. Saul had to hear the gospel preached by a human being, taught to him by a human being, the same as everybody else. Yes, Jesus caught his attention in the clouds, but it was a conversion in essence just like ours. He thought he was right and he was sincere as anybody's ever going to be. And he was as wrong as he was ever going to be. And, you know, that, that answers another great thing. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere about it. Well, you can be sincerely wrong. And Saul was. But do you see how it closes when you, when you, when you grasp that account in its clarity? How it knocks a death blow to a lot of the false ideas perpetuated by the religious community about how to be saved. Because see, no one's experience is greater than his. But yet, you, you, you see what it says. Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. He still had sins upon him. He, he was still a condemned sinner before God. He still needed those sins washed away. Although he had seen Jesus, spoke to Jesus, prayed and fasted for three days and nights, the sins were still upon him. It was only after the baptism was the, were the sins removed. Paul did not see the light, pray, was forgiven and then baptized. The sins were only washed away after that. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, he had been wrong up to that point, but you better believe he he believed in Jesus. Absolutely. And, you know, he had a, you know, had a real crisis of identity a crisis of, of where he was going to go with his life. What do you do now? You spent your whole life preparing for this moment to persecute the church and doing a pretty good job of it. And now come to realize not only it was all for nothing, it was complete opposition to God. Someone so sincere about trying to do what God wanted realized he was doing the exact opposite of what God wanted. That reality had to set in hard in that three days. And, and yeah, he's got faith. To say that he doesn't have faith at that point is kind of ridiculous. You know, to have spoken to Jesus, seen Jesus. So he's got faith in spades. I think, we, I think we'd agree with that. Is he repentant? I think it's ridiculous to suggest he's not repentant. He's pretty humbled. Confess? I bet he confessed about anything at that point. Prayed? Sought forgiveness? I mean, does anybody's conversion story beat that? No. I don't think anybody's does. And what saved him, what washed him away of his sins was to be baptized. If there are any exceptions to the salvation plan that we see in the New Testament, it should have been Him. But there wasn't an exception made for Him. In fact, He, is, he exemplifies the rule, you might say, in that regard. And the fact that even Jesus didn't tell Him what He needed to do to be saved. He just simply said, go and it will be told to you what you need to do to be saved. And so it is that message that we share to others. That message that Paul gives in this text, I think outlines it in great power. Now, 
he goes ahead and says, you're going to go to the Gentiles. And that angers everybody. But only after he said his peace. If he'd have said that at the beginning, they wouldn't have heard what he said. But he got his point across. And undoubtedly, there would have been some that heard it that day, that thought about it, that thought about it, that thought about it. And there were undoubtedly some that probably became Christians. Ultimately, as a result, we'll never know. But it happens. Okay, we are about two minutes late, except for the two minutes we started late.